okay, how do six billion people help each other help themselves is a question that's been uh, very specifically phrased to ask the positive life affirming qualities that we're looking for. So uh, this is phrased in an appreciative inquiry model of the positive question. It's also a little bit provocative, um, helping people help themselves as opposed to uh, them not having enough money and uh, what are our problems and uh, have too many problems and not enough money. So that's the, the framing question and uh, th this is not to say that there aren't real problems that require real money. Uh, I don't expect women in villages in Africa to invent a polio vaccine and uh, propagate it. Uh, there are things that are better done through experts and authority and hierarchical structures, uh, particularly disaster relief and whatever. But there are also things that could be done at the grassroots level, and, and that's really what I'd like to focus on in the, on the uh, workshop here, is what are the scalable small things, the little things that we could do in very large scale to uh, make things better. And one of the characteristics that I've noticed, and I'm carrying over, probably identifying a little too much with healthcare industry, but to the, the, uh, the development industry, if you will, and the, the, the current model is this kind of a, a, a stovepipe uh, interaction of you have the source of funding, you have a, a, these organizations that take the, the, the funding and deliver the services to the client. So it's a vertically integrated model. In a computer industry, I can compare that to the micro, mini computer and the microcomputer transition that happened. I think John talked about the punch card back in the uh, early days. But the, uh, in, the, in the early days of the mini computer, you had uh, Wang, DEC, uh, Digi Data General, whatever, all vertically integrated companies. And they all had their own package of hardware and disk drives and operating systems and support service in this vertically integrated stack. And they competed each other with each other as vertically integrated uh, organizations. Uh, the microcomputers came along, and Intel inv invented the developed the CPU and Microsoft did the operating system and Dell did the boxes and Seagate did the disk drives. And so we went from a, a vertically integrated mini computer industry to a horizontally layered microcomputer industry. So Intel and AMD were competing for the CPUs and Seagate and Fujitsu were just competing for the disk drives and everything. So there was this transition from the vertically integrated what I'll call stovepipe or sol uh, silo model to the th this horizontal layering thing. Um, and I, I think if you look at the United States at least, the NGO or nonprofit world, we have 1.4 million stovepipes, vertically integrated organizations. I understand there's 270,000 NGOs in Brazil. And they're all belonging to the same kind of vertically integrated model of, of taking money from a donor, delivering a service and putting it out the other end. Uh, to, uh, to flip this over to another uh, approach, um, the vertical model, and, and this requires each organization go through fundraising and administrative and, and, and getting the funds, administrating it in the United States the 501c3, support evaluation, and then at the very bottom is the delivery of the service. Okay, so this is the, the stack of activities that you have to do. So I don't know how many times I've talked to someone and they said, well, I have this neat idea, I want to start a 501c3 to, to do it. So do we need another uh, 501c3 in the United States or uh, is there some other way of, of doing this? So the, the model that I'm looking at here and, and proposing that we use is that we, we start with a, this horizontal layer. This, this is the mini computer, microcomputer model of, of what the mini computer industry transitioned to. And at the bottom layer is this communications layer. We are communicating through cell phones, through email, through blogs, incredibly new ways. I'm told the cell phone is very pre prevalent in the less developed countries and it's probably the, the leading communications tool. SMS, uh, higher speed there, the cell phone companies want to do video and everything else there. So huge development there and I'm, I'm just accepting that, okay, people are communicating. Uh, and there's the digital divide uh, thing of people trying to push this technology out further and further. So that's, that's already in place and happening. And um, whether it's good or bad, it's, it's happening. So I'm, I want to make it as good as possible. On top of that, uh, you could call it the social web or the web 2.0. It's a new buzzword. I don't know how long it'll be out there, but everything today on the web is 2.0. Uh, it's a new model of, of uh, kind of user-centric uh, computing rather than enterprise-centric. 
So you'd have uh, MySpace, it's 50 million kids are connecting with each other, uh, LinkedIn, um, lots of communities, um, and new ways of connecting people. But um, the point is that even this fairly simple low-cost camera can c connect people in new ways that's never been done before. Uh, cell phones, I have another podcast from a cell phone. You could just turn your, your cell phone on in a village in Africa, talk to someone, take that back to your office, and you've connected. So if you want to collect a story from a, a woman in Nepal that wants to talk about her, her transformation of her literacy, put on your cell phone and connect it. So what do you do with that? I mean, now we have an incredibly new t tool. Uh, we can connect in audio and visual. Uh, you don't need to be literate to, to use this communication tool. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on here that tremendous amount of energy there. Five years ago, if, if you were to talk about, well, let's put a million people online and give them email accounts, you'd have to figure out how to you know, buy enough computers and servers to do a million email accounts. Today, you just say, well, go ahead and get one in Hotmail or Gmail or Google or Yahoo. It's free. Uh, you know, put a million people new online for free. You want to have a blog? Blogs are free. You want to have a web page? You can do that in Yahoo. You want to have a network to connect people according to ideas? An incredible amount of things that are used to be very expensive are, are free today. So this is another layer that we can sit on top of. There's tremendous innovation there. I mean, on a daily basis, you learn something new there. So the layer on top of that, I think, is really what I'm interested in focusing on. I call it the do something layer. And it's people who do want to take action. And uh, the, traditionally, in the old model, it's send us money and don't ask questions. You know, write, send us your checks and get us on your uh, $29 a month uh, auto pay for your credit card. And uh, we'll, uh, some, we called it last night a cash cow for some of the charities that are now up to about a billion dollars a year collecting money for certain uh, activities. Well, rather than the, the focus being on the collecting money and feeding the 1.4 million silos, what I'd like to do is open up the discussion on the activities themselves. So what are we doing? Is it working? How do we do it better? Should we stop doing it? Are we doing the wrong thing? I mean, is this a bad thing that we're doing just because we've been doing it for the last 20 years or whatever? So the do something layer is an activity-based model rather than a program model. It's not a matter of saying, well, let's create a program to do uh, something over the next uh, 20 years according to these guidelines. It's a model of saying, what can we do, uh, what are the activities, and how do we get smarter doing that thing? So the do something model is what we'll be talking about of, of, of patterns of activity. So, Nanofinance is a pattern that we've been talking about for some time. It's savings-led microfinance uh, and the characteristics of that. But are there ways of talking about what we're doing framed in this positive manner that we can then learn and get smarter on the, at the activity level rather than a program level? So Marsha was, is with PACT. Uh, Jeff Ock, uh, Ash is with Oxfam. Uh, we didn't get anybody from CARE, but there's a lot of savings-led stuff from CARE. So we have three different organizations that we've been talking about on some other emails. They're all doing savings-led microfinance. What's, what's being learned there? And can we turn that into a general pattern? And other people can take that knowledge and replicate it in Guatemala uh, as simply as possible. Now, maybe, maybe nanofinance isn't workable that way. Maybe you can't just send somebody an email message and go to an internet cafe and download the materials and make it happen. I don't know. I, I, I don't know if we've tried that. Uh, are there other things we could do? So the, the, the idea is, given these tools, given the idea that we're, we're dealing with bit streams of, of uh, communication, what can we do that works, and how do we do it better over time? So the do it better layer is this knowledge feedback layer of saying, okay, now we're doing these things. The do it better looks down, and, and I call it pattern gardening in one way, of how do we... Uh, um, how do we learn what we're doing? How do we have this feedback loop? What are the values that we, we measure things by that says this was a good thing or not? Um, is it low birth weight babies in Bolivia? Um, maybe. Uh, is it uh, some other value thing? So this uh, also uh, struck me, Benoit, about your talk about values, and I'd like to ask that question later in the workshop, is what are these values and how do you, how do you convey those and what, what, what can you use for measuring against values rather than 
uh, uh, predefined um, uh, transactional metrics, if we want to call it that. So I'm um, obviously you've talked to me, you've, t you've heard me talk about self-organization and self-propagation and the the lessons learned here, uh, the, the web to me is the most spectacular self-organizing, self-propagating thing. Um, it started out remarkably simple and I remember in 1995 people were quite cynical about my enthusiasm for the web that now you go to a, you know, a restaurant, you have a web address in your marmalade jar. Um, eBay, same thing, it started uh, about 10 years ago uh, in the guy's living room, 150 million people. Uh, Wikipedia, um, how many people have heard of Wikipedia? Or ever, okay, there's no, no question about it. Um, it started five years ago. Uh, it's running neck and neck with the Encyclopedia Britannica in terms of its quality of, of the English version, but it's in 29 different languages and a million articles and updating daily. Uh, AA is another thing I've been very interested in as a self-propagating uh, network and um, have some, had some interesting topics on our uh, mailing list about that and the dependency model that we people talk about and the, the actual addiction. So I call it the problem addiction loop of we have organizations that can only know how to take an action when there's a problem to solve and to dissolve a problem or solve a problem before it manifests itself as a problem is, is a little bit too foresightful and uh, so we have to wait for the levees to break, then we can come in and fix them. But to get in there beforehand and fix the levees before they break is uh, another thing. Another example I like to use is the Mexican wave in La Ola, it's called, in a stadium. Everybody stands up and sits down in synchronization. That actually started in 1986 at the World Cup in Mexico City. And people first learned how to do the wave. And humanity learned a new trick. And I think it was due to the fact that they had video uh, playing back and people could see their own actions. But there's some interesting mathematics of, of waves. And the idea of, of uplift being a, a wave of activity rather than, OK, everybody be good forever and ever. Uh, but you pulse it with something, and there, there's some energy there. And then it, the, the people come back down to their, their rest state. But um, we have waves anyway. We have the hurricanes and tsunamis and 9-11 that creates a tremendous wave of energy. But in 9-11, um, $2.4 billion worth of donations, 175,000 donors that uh, came out of the woodwork and after September 11th. Within six months, the trust and charities plummeted to a 25-year low. So we had this incredible outpouring of generosity and compassion. The feedback was distrust and cynicism. So this is not right. This is not a way you run civilization. People who do take actions out of generosity and compassion should feel hey, that's good, let me do more of it. So why, why, what's wrong? Why are we feeding back negatively to the very positive core values that we want to deal with? So we talk about the uh, spotlight effect in some of my writings, that suddenly we have a tsunami, everybody's giving to the tsunami, and Niger uh, famine is not on the hot list anymore, so it doesn't get any money or attention. Um, so I call it the uh, most media most mediagenic misery index. So whatever can get to the top of the list, bigger than Brad Pitt or Angelina Jolie or whatever, gets the attention, but then it fades away. Now Charles McLean, who's not here, but it's on our list, has done some studies on the uh, donor funding that's showing that the, the funding for other organizations did drop and received that back saying, here's what's hot. Here's what everybody else in this community is looking at. Um, it seems like an invasion of privacy at some, to some people. Uh, at the same time, this is what Google already knows about you. And when you start seeing what information you're actually giving other people, and uh, uh, it's, it's amazing. But anyway, pay attention is one of the things I'm going to look at. Uh, of How do you pay attention to what's working? How do you get that feedback going there? And how do you get the, the many eyeballs approach to understanding these things rather than the few experts? So I don't want to convene a meeting of homogeneous people in Paris to decide the right way to save the world. Uh, I want to build an infrastructure, have a million eyeballs on the problem. Um, if you notice the recent uh, Korea stem cell uh, 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 scandal about the research that published, it wasn't the peer reviewers that caught the scandal, it was the readers. So it was the many eyeballs of the people reading the journal that said, hey, these, this guy's a fraud. And that came back here. But the formal expert review of the thing uh, came from the, uh, um, from the readers. <laughs> so that many eyeballs, there's a book called The Wisdom of Crowds, James Sherwicki. Um, I agree with some of it. Um, 
But the, the idea of having a whole lot of things happening at a small scale and then using that to feed the, the feedback loop and decreasing the characteristic scale so that you have smaller and smaller activities but you have a whole lot more of them. So if you have you know, a billion dollar environmental remediation project, that's fine, I mean, maybe we need one there. But what if you had a million one dollar activities up here, uh, women washing their hands, uh, or people washing their hands, the infant diarrhea kills two million babies a year, one million apparently could be saved through improved hand washing practices. Rather than creating the, you know, the World Congress on hand washing and having the 64 delegates decide the one correct way to do hand washing, push it down there. There's, there's a whole lot of people that have some ideas about how to get people to wash hands. And maybe in Ghana it's different than Indonesia or whatever. But can you use this many eyeballs approach and whoever comes up with a hand washing pattern that gets people to wash their hands and have less diarrhea, um, go there. So basically it's a search and discovery model of a, a very large scale uh, deployment of small scale activities that I'm interested in portraying. Now, and I, and I don't mean to diminish large scale projects and polio eradication is, is an intervention that requires it. I'm just saying let's explore what we can do down here. What, what are the new things here, the new technologies, what are they giving us? And at some point it reaches a tipping point. The, the system takes over on itself. And David Reed talked about this in our Boston workshop. He called it a phase transition in a network. That as a network grows in scale, it goes into a quantitatively different realm. It's like going from ice to water. And I call this snowflakes in some of my things. And the snowflake model is when the environment is in such that you lower the, the temperature and you get increased order and increased energy. But the, uh, and, and increased diversity. But at some point, you, you can act, the network takes over a whole different characteristic. So the web started out as a very simple thing. Pretty soon it turned into the dot-com revolution, uh, totally unpredicted by the initial conditions. So the, the, the thing I'm trying to focus on is this, this curvature here. You know, lots of little things that can be done at low cost, not bound by financial considerations. Obviously, money is required. We, I'm not saying that money's not important, but you don't start out with the context that we have too many problems and not enough money and we can only pay for the worst problems. So looking for these things that work here, the, the surreptitious hand washing or whatever, uh, to me has tremendous uplift potential. And, and I, I don't think this is fully understood by the industry. The people who are, are funded according to the current models don't look at the world this way. And they might not ever look that way because it's actually cutting them out of the picture. You know, we're, if, if women learn to wash their own hands, they're not going to have an NGO running around telling them how to do it, you know, for example. So the same thing in the healthcare industry, uh, the innovation has to kind of come from outside on the fringe, not, not expecting the center to give it there. So if you look at the web and how it took off, it started out very simply with URLs, HTTP, and HTML. Uh, URL is the identity of the object, okay? Uh, that's what, what you see on the marmalade jar. HTTP is a pattern of communication and a way of communicating between clients and servers. HTML is a way of establishing the relationship between these pages. So if you look at this, this is identity, connectivity, and relationship were the three things that Tim Berners-Lee invented in the web. He didn't invent search engines. He didn't invent uh, categorization schemes. He didn't do a Dewey Decimal System to define how the web was going to be organized. He created this chaotic mess of web pages that then search engines emerged from that. So Yahoo and Excite and eBay and Google all emerged over time. He also put in constraints. So it had to be under Internet Protocol, IP. And this is very interesting in the sense of good neighbors make good fences. And the, what What's attractive to that is that um, there was a prodigy in a CompuServe and an AOL that were very powerful networks at the time, far, far larger than e either the internet or the, uh, the web pages themselves. So what he did is he just created this new space completely independent of the proprietary networks of the time. So he didn't go to prodigy and AOL saying, how do we integrate your system so the prodigy can talk to AOL? He just created something in, in the web space. It started out on his desktop. I, I showed a picture of the world's first web page on my paper there. And it took off. There's billions of, of pages there. So I call this an autocatalytic space. The space fuels itself as it gets bigger. 
As you put stuff in it, it, it makes itself bigger. So when Amazon appeared on the web, it didn't use up the web in the way that Barnes & Noble uses up a shopping center space when they put in a physical store. Profoundly different. The, the, the scarcity of a shopping center space, which makes shopping center space valuable, and the, 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 the primariness of the, the location, that's what creates value in a shopping center. That's not what creates value in, in the web world. So Amazon drawing more people into the web, drew more attention, made, made it more valuable for themselves, and it fueled the web. So Amazon didn't use up the web. Its appearance on the web made it bigger. So if you have this autocatalytic space, and, and the space itself fuels itself, is it possible to create an autocatalytic space for, for good things to happen? You know, if, if I do something out of, of generosity or peace or love or any of the virtues, I'm not using up your virtues there. You know, you're, you're, if we could all become more peaceful and in so doing, amplify everybody else's peace. So virtues don't work that way. Virtues are not scarce commodities. And the, the, the goodness of the world, if you will, can be amplified and good stuff can trigger more good stuff. Now, the, the most critical thing there is we have to recognize that and build the, the, the value system in there that the good stuff does replicate. So the people who do donate to the 9-11 uh, funds feel like they've, they want to do more of it. They don't need to have people calling you at supper time saying, please give more money. So is it possible to create this, this space for good things to happen and in, 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 in trigger more good things as a result of that? So the good things are, are visible. We're illuminating the good things. And we're growing that through this autocatalytic model. Um, rather than the scarcity model. So starting out with this model of abundance, there, there is a, an abundance of things we could do at some level. Uh, what, what can you do more for it? So I, I skip over that particular one, the Mexican wave. Uh, Alcock's Anonymous um, was, was interesting f uh, for several levels. One is the uh, common trigger event uh, hitting bottom. The AA.com is a wealth of information on this. They have a well-defined protocol, which is really the core pattern of AA. Okay, anonymity is another thing. They don't know how many people are in the organization because they're anonymous. Uh, it has this viral model to it that one of the steps in AA is to pass it on. So there's a pay it forward uh, model to AA. Um, it was underfunded. When it was founded, the guy started it, went to Rockefeller and said, uh, I want to do this. And, he said, well, that's fine, but we're not going to pay for it. So he gave him a very modest starting point. He said the chapters have to be self-funded. And uh, so that they, they, had he funded the chapters and say, OK, we'll give you $1,000 a chapter to start out, it probably wouldn't have taken off. So as a result, um, it's a very, very lean organization. And uh, you know, it's, it's self-funding. Self the other thing is it deals with this notion of addiction. And I've been talking to some positive psychology people about uh, addiction and of phrasing things as this problem addiction loop, that we just have built this infrastructure that we don't know how to deal with things unless they're a declared problem. And uh, this comes from Peter Senge's work on the problem addiction loop of, of trying to fix things. Your fixes create more problems and it makes you, make you look like you're being more productive because you've got more problems to fix, even though you're, you're fixing the thing. I call it trying to get out of a hole by digging it deeper. And uh, so anyway, this is just an area that I'm interested in looking at. And I've been talking to some psychologists, very interested in the, the psychology of addiction and what AA has done to, to get out of it, and point out that AA has also evolved into other forms of addictive and 12-step programs. There's a whole area of, of uh, self-help groups that Ken Hope, Ken Hope, Ken Hamilton is active with in Hope Healing. Random Acts of Kindness, a very similar uh, movement, um, and the reframing. Uh, it came out of uh, somebody reading uh, Random Acts of Violence, uh, the newspaper tagline, and saying, well, how do we flip that around? So can we have Random Acts of, of Kindness there? A uh, very strongly story-based. The books were um, based on stories. And uh, it was very successful. It kind of peaked out. It got bought out by a, uh, a, another org foundation. And uh, when I tell, it, it kind of faded away after it got formally supported. But uh, Will Glennon was at some of our previous meetings on positive media, who's one of the, he, was, he published the original Random Acts books. Another thing about Random Acts is one of the acts was to pay the toll booth fare from somebody behind you on the bridge. So you, you just pay double your toll, and somebody behind you can now 
accept that as a gift or pass it on to the person behind them so that you can have this whole chain of people giving their toll one, one link back and it'll go 20 or 30 cars. Well, if, if all you're doing is measuring the transactions across the bridge, you don't see anything. You don't see that people have, are giving each other this, their toll. And somebody is going to spoil it and say, okay, I got a free gift and not pass it on. But you don't understand the, the, the value of that uh, random act of kindness by looking at the transactions on the, the cash register tape at the toll booth. And this points out the, the problems of trying to understand a transformational activity uh, in the terms of transactional analysis. So trying to just take all these snapshots, evaluate them according to previously defined charts of accounts, adding these up, and then say, okay, now we understand the whole system, is just wrong. It, is, it works for your bank account. It works for things that are specifically transactional. It doesn't work for health. It doesn't work for development. It doesn't work for education. Um, and it's a 500-year-old accounting system that we have um, that comes out of Venice, this whole, whole notion of double-entry bookkeeping, of pre-binding the transactions to accounts, of assuming that you can add up all the transactions and understand the whole. Um, this, this is wrong. It's just not capable of expressing what we need to do to understand the complex evolutionary things we're doing today. To add another bottom line to it, a double bottom line, triple bottom line, tenth bottom line, to add another IQ to education, oh, we don't have enough IQs, so we need eight IQs to measure our students with, uh, to add another uh, healthcare assessment, quality of life, years, months, whatever, is just continuing the same problem of assuming that you can add these things up linearly and come up with the bottom line. And just because it's a number doesn't mean it's right. So one of the things that I like to, to, to see happen with the Uplift Academy is, is look at ways of understanding this transformational value, the things that are, quote, intangible to the transactional accounting system. So we'll talk a little bit about value webs. And uh, John, maybe you could say something too today. Uh, today at 4, if we get everything set up, we'll have a, a Valdis Krebs dialing in on value web analysis or social network analysis. But the idea that there's a lot of intangibles that don't show up in the uh, transactional analysis that need to be pointed out, understood. I might also point out David Ellerman uh, has written a paper on a mathematical analysis of our accounting system. He says it's the only one that he's ever heard of. In 500 years, we've had one mathematical analysis of the, our accounting system that drives everything. So maybe it's time for revisiting that. Maybe we could come up with a smarter accounting system. So I missed my slide here, but yesterday we had accounting 1.0. So tomorrow, let's have accounting 2.0 and uh, come up with this transformational understanding. And I, I've got some ideas on that. But that's a, another theme that I'd like to develop. So if you look at the common characteristics of the eBay, the Wikipedias, the AA, and things like that. Um, Jimmy Wales, when he did Wikipedia, didn't ask the National Association of Encyclopedia Writers how to do an a encyclopedia. So he started the space. Many, many other people, by the way, have written wikis that, that didn't work. And uh, so there's a lot of experiments that, that uh, were tried and didn't happen. So for every successful experiment, there's uh, more than a few that didn't make it. But the, the point is there is this tremendous explosion of, of parallel experimentation that David will talk about, of trying lots of thing, things, planting a lot of seeds. The ones that worked grew, and Wikipedia happened, and eBay happened. There were a lot of dot companies that didn't, didn't happen, uh, or that tried and didn't work. Uh, some of them were probably overfunded, $40 million to bring up a website and, uh, versus the uh, eBay that came up from, from nothing. I think Midiar is proud of the fact that they still have the $5 million, their first uh, venture capital investment in eBay. They never, they never use the money, and uh, they just uh, put it in a bank someplace. So uh, Pierre still has his first $5 million check. Yeah. Anyway, I uh, didn't ask permission. Tim Berners-Lee didn't go to the World Wide Web uh, or the United Nations Security Council say, can I create the World Wide Web? Just did it. Uh, and, and so the sense of just doing it and with the right initial conditions and letting it feed itself. So you don't need to go to a, an authoritative organization to do this. You, you know, at the, this a small scale level. You just need to start from the grassroots and, and fuel it. Uh, they had a very good sense of what was necessary to be right from the beginning and what was necessary to be good enough. So with the World Wide Web, uh, Tim Berners-Lee had to invent the URL 
correctly from the beginning because that was going to stick around forever. So the same URL that we see today was, was there in 1993 or whatever. Uh, the HTTP and HTML have changed over time. So he just threw together HTML, some would say far too simply. But the, the, some of the technology was, was just done good enough to get it started and say, hey, this is what it could be like, and then 1.0 is this, and let's go to 2.0 next year. So that this, this sense of knowing what needs to be right and what needs to be good enough, I think, was, was important for all of them. Uh, they had a positive goal. They weren't fighting a problem. They were, they were promoting some uh, uh, goal of, of activities. Uh, eBay was uh, making the markets more efficient. Tim Berners-Lee was creating a, a space for information to uh, exist. And uh, they, they, the goal itself had this autocatalytic effect. I mean, if the, the goal of the web was to catalog all physics literature, by the time you get to near the end of the physics literature, you've reached your goal and there's nothing left anymore if you've got physics online. So he created a space for information to exist, so physics does it, genomics is doing and things like that. So it, the, the goal itself was broad enough and appreciatively phrased enough to trigger things to take off in their own direction. And they were highly scalable. So the, the, the bigger it got, the better it goes. So we're not going to run out of domain names on the web. Um, as scarce as some people like to make them, we can always add more domain names. Um, there, there's going to be some that are more desirable than others, but okay. Anyway, she, she was part of a savings-led microfinance group in Mali with Oxfam International. And they were apparently getting a little bit slow in propagating the, the teaching to the other villages. So she went off and taught 10 other villagers how to do this without Oxfam helping her. So she had this spontaneous autocatalytic effect. So if, if, if you see her face, um, it, it's, it's just a snap from a video, but she has this incredible sense of determination. I wish I had a video to show you, but you know, you know that she was going to do that. So uh, <clears throat> anyway, the, the whole model of, of uh, the joy of sharing knowledge, and you know, this was her, her thing. She wanted to do it. This was uplifting to her. So one of the, the roles that we're talking about is called the network animator. Uh, Jeff uses the animator, and there's a French term that's equivalent to that. Uh, animatru, animat, I guess there's a gender specific. And these are kind of the boundary spanners between the electronic networks and the physical face-to-face -face networks. So her village doesn't have broadband to the village pump yet, and maybe it never will. But if we could help her uh, be the, 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 the spanner between the, the electronic network and the village network, I would trust her what, you know, she wants to go teach people how to do savings and microfinance. If she's spending her energy doing that, that's self-evidently good for me to, to say. So the fact that women are running around teaching each other these things is goodness from my standpoint. And I would be very comfortable saying, let's help her do more of that. Now, it's possible she could be a scam artist and sucking money out of the, the poor donors and things like that. Whatever, I don't know. But she seems to be a self-evidently good thing. And I'm, I'm happy to, to, to talk about this later. And this is being video broadcast, and probably Sally will see it sometime. So I'd like to disassociate it with, from Sally specifically, uh, but as we talk about network animators. But um, anyway, this, this just caught me out of that video, that her sense of determination and uh, you know this self-organizing, self-propagating thing. So finding more of these types of people who have this energy and amplifying it to me seems to be a great way of of leveraging this out. And I, I don't think there's any shortage of these people. When I've talked to people, and I, I completely have to admit that I, I'm not skilled in what's happening in the less developed countries. I've visited, I've been a tourist, and taken pictures, and but I've never worked there. And I know that I don't know that, and I'm living in California in my easy chair with my laptop and uh, talking about the world. So I recognize that. So uh, I, I don't know what it's like to be in Ghana. I'd like to find out a little bit more. But uh, I do think I can add some value at the technology level and turn this technology over for other people to do their own things. So I'm, I'm not saying, you know, this is the world according to Tom. I'm saying that the technology we can do to do this. Um, so one of the things I've learned from Verna Ali and the Knowledge Management Group uh, and John Maloney 
is this notion of value webs, and they call it roles and flows. And flows we also talked about in Boston, about um, complementary currency, um, the, uh, the relationship model of things, um, and uh, the, the network connection. So there's a sense of, of transformational flow is, is really what we're trying to encourage, this energy of people, what Sally was talking about, trying to do that. So the roles that I'm just throwing up as a uh, kind of a straw man architecture, if you will, just some ideas, is to use the word helpers and doers. Uh, this comes from David Ellerman's book. Um, and to get away from the donors and recipients. And I think this is one of the first things that I learned in my first workshop with Marsha uh, and some others, is that um, check writing isn't the, the thing to focus on. You don't, you don't say I'm rich or poor and have a checkbook in your pocket and say what can we do to help. And so the, the notion of helpers and doers as a, a way of getting a, a reframing the quote donor recipient model uh, really appeals to me. In fact, flipping that around so that the helpers are in the third world and the doers are in the developed countries is very appealing to me. And I'd, I'd like to look at some patterns of that. I was talking to Lawrence over coffee about a drum casting. And Mac also, Mac's not here, but um, drumming is a very universal skill and uh, a cultural thing. The idea would be to uh, take a drum cast, or uh, take a, somebody in the north wants to learn drumming. So they play on their drums or whatever. But take it and record it on a camera or their t or their cell phone, send it through email to a village in Ghana or whatever, and the the villagers can teach them how to drum. Say, oh, by the way, you know, whatever, and they can drum back. Or we could even have the technology where they could drum on top of what you sent. So you're actually drumming interactively with the Ghanese Ghan Ghanaian, Ghanaian uh, drummers. Well, that's that's neat. I, I belong to a drum circle in San Diego. Every Sunday night we go out there and I. Uh, the djembe drum that I bring out there. And I have a good time. I'm really bad at it, but I'm, it's a lot of fun. But to actually buy a drum lesson from Ghana and get it back in a week, I'm I'm getting something from this uh, long, you know, Ghanaian drummers are really great drummers. And uh, so I, you know, I'm, this is a neat skill. Anyway, the drummer is in Ghana and the the, the doer is in California. So I'm paying $10 for a drum lesson, which is a great deal. The Ghanaian drummers are, are, are providing a skill and a, and a knowledge. So anyway, we're building this connection connectivity through uh, music, through culture, through time and everything, and actually delivering value, uh, helping them. So what appeals to me that is it, it opens up this pattern of, of interaction uh, away from the one directional uh, helpers and doers. OK, network animators is another role. That kind of the bridge elements or, or boundary spanners, if you want to talk network dynamics, of the people who do have access through an NGO or an internet cafe or whatever, and can run out to the village with their with their iPod. So I have uh, Marcia and Tom's conversation on my iPod from last night. I uh, I put the bottle up on a wine the, the the camera up on a wine bottle and they started talking and I downloaded it here. So pretty neat stuff. And so we have the. Uh, that MP3 players, I think you can get them for $19 in California at least right now. They'll be in cell phones. Uh, so the, the, you could put it onto a, uh, a CD, take it out there, or a cassette. So you could connect between the, the, the electronic network and the face-to-face -face network. And the people who do this, we could call network weavers. Uh, and Valdis will be talking about the role of network weavers. And one of the strategic things you could do is, is kind of say, well, here are some connections. Uh, Ghana doesn't have uh, enough connections here. So you might strategically go in there and invest in a, a broadband uh, cable connection. Maybe a, a helper could pay for the internet cafe costs for uh, a network weaver. And that could be your, your donation, if you will. I'm going to help uh, Sally's uh, internet cafe costs, and I'll pay her $5 a month for that. And pattern gardeners is another term um, throwing out. I'm not haven't finalized on that right now. But these patterns of activities, the things that are working, drum casting, for example. Uh, yes, it needs somebody to make it happen. You know, I got a good idea. I put it on my on my blog or something. But somebody needs to take the lead and, and make it happen. So a pattern gardener is a role that we're looking at. That um, would be somebody who takes that and runs with it. Who has the 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 champion attitude towards that idea. So somebody who wants to make drum casting 
uh, work would, would edit the, the web page. So my idea right now is to actually have a wiki for patterns of uplift. And drum casting is a topic in that the pattern gardener would would update the, the wiki and, and make it grow and somebody else come in and say, well, you missed Indonesian thumb drumming and whatever, and suddenly you got thumb drumming and hand drumming, I don't know. And the, it, it grows like the Wikipedia grows about knowledge, but this is a specific pattern of drumming. Now, if somebody abuses this and say, you know, it's a Nigerian scammer, I, sorry about Nigeria, but it's a, a scam of some sort, um, that should be part of the knowledge base. People are scamming this. People are saying, we'll send you a drum, and they're not sending you the drum or whatever. And that should be visible and open and transparent. And sooner or later, people who scam others are not going to be around, or at least be uh, uh, dealt with. So those are the, some of the roles that I'm throwing out for this network of a highly scalable network that could grow according to the six billion uh, model. It is the, the notion that there are many many flows of value that, that you can look at, and these are things that are, quote, intangible to the accounting system. Um, I, if I had the eBay picture, which I don't ha have handy, uh, they did a value web analysis of, of eBay and what eBay did. You think of eBay as a transaction between buyers and sellers in a, in a commission, but in fact, there's a, like 30 different value flows that happen in eBay the reputation system, the pricing information, the community formation. And there's all these, these dots that link eBay, and it's a far richer, far more organic organization than people see by looking at the, the, the transactions. So the accounting system and Wall Street sees the bottom line, but in reality, eBay is a very rich ecosystem of interaction and things like that. So this is one of the, of the models that I'm looking at right now is, is this uh, uh, value web value web analysis, and um, doing the, I had a, a workshop with John uh, on April 7th in San Francisco uh, with uh, Verna Ali, and Valdis will be talking a little bit about this uh, this afternoon. What attracts me to this is that it opens up a, a formalism for talking about transformational activities independent of the transaction system. So is it possible to use this, and I've, I've thrown out some uh, uh, language design. I've, I'm actually calling it value definition language. And uh, it's a meta language to describe all this that would have the transformational flows described. So the roles and flows would be described there. Could you actually go in there and then say, when one of these things happens, send a message back to the server and we, we will detect that uh, an animator formed a new network group. So you have this idea of having a dashboard and you can see what the network is doing. So th there's a whole bunch of new people that are doing this. Uh, they're applying this pattern. This pattern is getting a lot of activity. And you can see the flow of activities through a, a, a dashboard panel. And I, 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 I don't have the in demonstration there. But this also relates to this attention trust model that we're looking at. So the pay attention model feeds into this. Could you feed us with a complementary currency? Uh, we, we tried something with Sergio Lube and Friendly Favors uh, using thank yous. Um, it didn't take off, but it was an interesting example. But could you have a complementary currency that would measure these things? So when a pattern gardener uh, spends 10 hours gardening a pattern, could they earn 10 thank yous that would then be spendable for uh, you know drum lesson in Ghana, whatever? Um, so I have another theme called uh, the philo, uh, it was kind of patterned after Bernard Lyotard's work, and instead of the euro, we have the philo, means love of humanity, as a complementary currency. And could we fund all this through the currency? Could, so could the Uplift Academy be the central banker on a complementary currency and pay for this all? And the interesting thing about complementary currencies is that they increase their value, or any currency, they increase their value with trust, the trustworthiness of the currency, and the size of the community that uh, uses it. So more people using it, more trust, the more value, suddenly everybody's motivated to make this thing more, more valuable. So it seems to me there's an autocatalytic value there. There's a whole lot of psychological value to complementary currencies that I don't understand. I also understand that most economists think complementary currency people are, uh, I think, mon money cranks, is that the term, David? Currency, currency cranks. So uh, it's a little dubious, but on the other hand, I sure like my frequent flyer miles. And if I had, you know, $432 instead of uh, 100,000 miles, 
the, the miles just seem to be a whole lot different than the, the dollars. So, um, so that's another theme that I think is quite valuable. We had a number of people in Boston working on that. Uh, good intentions aren't good enough. That's another theme that uh, I want to look at with uh, Tom Dichter in his book called Despite Good Intentions. And uh, this, the story I first ran across was uh, uh, in a book called The Road to Hell by Michael Marin. He talked about a Somali uh, charity that was building orphanage. And uh, the Somalis have this notion of extended families. And you don't have an orphan. You just have somebody that lives with a different part of the family. So they wanted to build an orphanage and have all these metrics to make sure their orphanage was right. So they, you're going to have 432 orphan visits a year or whatever. So the final scene in the story was this truck in a refugee camp pulling out all these kids with the village elders saying, hey, you're stealing our children. So the, the, the Canadian charity thought they were building an orphanage. The Somalis thought they were stealing children. This is the story in the book, whether it's real or not. But the, it just shows the disconnect between the good intentions and the, the net effect. And I'm very, very sensitive to that. I'm very sensitive that we're talking about very powerful models of a whole bunch of people doing a lot of things out of good intentions. Uh, somehow we have to feed back what's working and what's not working. Um, the downside is you could do terribly wrong thing. The, the upside is you could find out very quickly what is working and what isn't. And so if you design the feedback system correctly, if you def define the the, the reverse flow of information saying this was a good idea or not, um, you have a whole lot more opportunities to self-correct the system. And uh, so Wikipedia is doing that with uh, 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 knowledge articles. It doesn't always work. Um, uh, Neurolinguistic programming is a, an example there that there's just two widely divergent groups and never the two shall meet. Abortion was another thing, uh, pro-life, pro-choice. So they the stuff that was common, they go here, and then they said the pro-life people are here and the pro-choice people are here, and they both have their spaces. And you, you see the fork and you go there. So maybe savings-led savings microfinance and debt-based microfinance merge. Maybe they go off in different directions. But I think we have enough space in the conceptual design to accept the divergence of opinions and and transparently resolve what's going on here, rather than assume that somebody with that, the, the correct way is going to uh, decide this. So my, my hope is by having a small enough granularity, so the lots of room to try it off and hope that he can make it off the air runway. So you want a pessimistic pilot. If the, if the downside is catastrophic and it is a big deal, you don't want to hope that you're going to make it right. Okay? If, it's, if it's a small enough thing, it, it pays to have an optimistic outlook. And this comes out of positive psychology and Martin Seligman. So again, by having the, the small enough scale with enough feedback and enough understanding built into the network, uh, you can turn things loose into a self-organizing, self-propagating thing. The other lesson I've learned from talking to both Google and eBay is what I call a giant feedback machine. That um, eBay might be, sound like it's an auction system, but it was really doing is it's feeding back reputation and prices to people on a very large scale. Google, whenever you search in Google, it's watching what you're searching for and watching what you find. And when you skip down to the third element and click there, it's, it's understanding that and saying, well, that was the, the right click for that search. So Google is a giant feedback machine. And uh, they're phenomenally intelligent feedback from all these searches that people do. So the, the better Google gets, the more people use it, the smarter it gets. So it's this, this feedback loop. They're actually translating uh, from English into Arabic now uh, simply through uh, looking at the text online. So the team of people who are doing this translation, none of them know any Arabic at all. It's just, just computer scientists looking at the statistical processes here. And they're approaching the expert-based uh, translation. Well, that's amazing. Uh, I, you know, from a computer science standpoint, um, the, 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 the scale that you can do there, if you can translate from Arabic to, to English to Arabic purely by observing what's going on there, can you see, use that same pattern matching and quote artificial intelligence model and say, geez, we've got this umpteen zillion patterns of activities there. We're doing this all these times over. Can we learn what works and do more of it? So I think there are some interesting things you can do there. But the, again, the key is the feedback loop. You've got to understand what the net effect of your your thing was. So 
power values of humanity, and what are the values that we can use that uh, would base this uh, serve as a foundation for this basis. So, um, Benoit, I'd like you to talk a little bit later in the workshop about living values and what what they've done in terms of values uh, uh, in, in their educational programs, particularly how they uh, use these for internally developed statements within the villages and within the community. So it's not the experts telling the villages what their values are. Um, the transactional model and the bottom line metric is not going to work for this. I, I, sorry. Uh, it, it just can't add up the pieces and assume that you have the whole anymore. And uh, this is a lesson time after time. So we need a better way of understanding value and the flow of, of what's working than, than the bottom line. That's not to say we have to throw out capitalism. Uh, I think you can maybe save capitalism with a different accounting system. Um, but, um, and can we talk about this outside of religious or political discourse? So um, the, the reason being is people get really excited about these topics and if everybody thought like me, you know, the world would be a better place. So that, that's the theme of conversation is getting everybody else to think like you. Uh, it's a great thing to do on a blog and write essays and things like that. But for a group collaborative effort, um, I'm trying to define a layer that we could talk about better world activities or uplift uh, independent of specific religious or political uh, uh, discourse. And uh, recovering the language of virtue and the language of what's good outside of, of a religious context, I think is, is also of, of great value. And I, I, think, uh, I think it's a very valuable thing that we need to do. So it says, well, our descendants judge that we were good ancestors. And the reason I use that is, first of all, it's a positive, appreciative question. And it builds in this sense of time of, of us anticipating what our descendants will say about us. But you could also say our descendants can come back and look at us and, and give us a reputation. So I might say, I'm going to go off and save the world. And you actually declare that in a, in a, in a, in a blog type thing. And I call it the way forward machine. But people say, this is what my goals are. And this is what I want to do. And now you're, you're kind of held accountable to that. I, I, this is what I'm going to do. Your descendants can come back, and, and you'll know that they, they have a way of uh, commenting on what, what, what you did. And uh, one of my other roles is as a fellow for the Civic Ventures Group, which is, um, uh, has a thing called the Purpose Prize uh, for $500,000 awards for people after the age of 50 that have started a uh, humanitarian activity. Not necessarily development, uh, but it's, most, it's all based in the United States. But the boomer generation, the people who were 1950 and around there, uh, it was a good year. You know, and, uh, but uh, anyway, I call it working for your grandchildren. And suddenly, you, you see a purpose to your life other than uh, you know, survival of your own uh, state. And um, I've been told that there's, in healthcare, the moment of, of a, a, a newborn mother is a very fertile time to, to educate them and train them and give them uh, messages. that. Uh, a mother with a, a newborn child is very, very trainable. And I think that also uh, relates to uh, grandparents, prob grandfathers probably more than grandparents, or daughter, grandmothers. But um, having a grandchild is also a trigger event in people's lives. And uh, Billy Crystal talks about this. He was in tears in some interview about how meaningful his granddaughter was to him. And so this is, a, 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 I think, a key transformational time in people's lives when they first see the next generation coming out. And it's a very fertile time to reach them and engage them in something. So um, the boomer generation is a huge demographic bulge. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm very interested in is, is how do you tap into that and give people an opportunity to give, or, or uh, I call it outing compassion. Somebody who's uh, made a career in business as a hard driving CEO of a competitive company. Um, being compassionate isn't a skill that uh, endears you to your board of directors. Uh, so when you turn to grandfather and they might want to use your skills for something new. So that's, that's one of the themes that I'm also looking at is, is uh, some kind of a fellowship program or a connecting program to, to take people who are at this stage in life and uh, uh, focusing on that. But sh short of that specific role, um, the good ancestor principle is kind of combining the uh, sustainability model, rather than sustainability being something you add on to a, a closed system, you build that in. That's another 
whole theory of open systems. To, today, our notion of an open system is always, uh, this is a closed system, and we'll add something to it to make it open. Uh, I, I would like to use the helper-doer language for now and, and instead of donor-recipient and get people away from it, particularly interested in reverse flows from the less developed countries to the developed countries. Um, it, it has to be autocatalytic. It has to be, you do a little bit and it feeds itself. So what are, what are, what's this energy that, that makes it fuel itself?